I think first of all, just the, the terminology, the term radiculopathy it, is still overly used when we're, we're actually meaning radicular pain. Where do you see maybe some of the challenges, whether it be a new physio, a student physio in, in uni, or even some experienced physios, where there's some struggles in maybe concepts or examination skills or assessments? Because I'm just curious where you feel folks fall maybe a little bit short on that. We want to enter the pathway, advice and education, supported exercise, nerve root block, surgical consultation. We want to enter that pathway at the least intrusive position. So now that doesn't necessarily mean... Lumbar radiculopathy. If you practice in a musculoskeletal practice, you see these regularly. But are you classifying them correctly? Are you assessing and examining them using best practice? Are you using correct terminology when diagnosing them? In this week's episode of the Modern Pain Podcast, we'll sit down with Adam Dobson and discuss this and more. Adam shares his expertise, and I'm confident that you're going to come out of this episode with a better understanding of lumbar radiculopathy. If you want to go deeper on topics like this, make sure you check out our community at modernpaincare.com forward slash community. Now, on to the episode. This is the Modern Pain Podcast with Mark Cargilla. Adam, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Mark. Good to be here. We've been able to get to know you a bit digitally through Twitter and, and hearing a lot of your discussions around lumbar radiculopathy and definitely a thing we see in clinic regularly. And hopefully this week's episode will get into that a bit and give you guys some actionable things that you can use in clinic to better examine, better treat, and better move these folks into more evidence-based and person-centered approaches with lumbar radiculopathy. But before we get into that this week, Adam, do you mind introducing yourself? And I'd love if you could let folks know how you ended up specializing in this specific topic. I'm Adam. Hello, everyone. I'm a physiotherapist from the UK in the northeast of England. I, I specialize and work almost exclusively with patients with lower back related problems. So I don't actually see the whole of the spine, which I know is a little bit novel although you kind of do inadvertently. I, I help people with low back related problems, so that low back pain, radicular kind of syndromes, stenosis, radicular pain. And I also run a rehabilitation program for people with persistent back pain. So it's everything lower back, everything people related. I've done that for about five or six years now. Prior to that, I worked privately in orthopedics, and I always had an interest in spines, had a brilliant mentor at the time who brought the service on, kind of mentored me, it kind of enriched a lot of critical thinking. And we went on a couple of cognitive functional therapy courses together. So it's kind of like the back and the spine become a big part of my life, maybe about 10 years now. And it's, it's interesting how we all find our little niches of in our practices and things like that. And, and the low back, obviously, there's plenty of low back pain around to uh, support many a clinician. So uh, I'd, I will have to touch upon a little bit of your experiences with cognitive functional therapy, how that kind of integrates within your management of, of lumbar radiculopathy. Let's touch upon a little bit of where you see some of the challenges with lumbar radiculopathy, when it comes from an assessment kind of component, that's where we'll start. Maybe where do you see maybe some of the challenges, whether it be a new physio, a student physio in, in uni, or even some experienced physios, maybe where there's some struggles in maybe concepts or examination skills or assessments? Because I'm just curious where you feel folks fall maybe a little bit short on that. I think, first of all, just the, the terminology, the term radiculopathy it is still overly used when we're, we're actually meaning radicular pain, even the word sciatica, of course. But terminology in documentation between clinicians is often quite imprecise. And so if you're going to use those words, then we should have a kind of a operational definition. There's a nice paper by Anina Schmid just last year, which kind of looked to operationally define some of these terms. So that's a brilliant paper to start on. I would also say as well is the patients often have quite mixed presentations. So we have this kind of idea that people have pain types where we have pathic pain at one side in a box and then we have nociceptive pain at the other side in a box. 
And so their neuropathic kind of presentation is almost the radicular pain. And then the nociceptive kind of presentation is the somatic referred pain. But in reality, that these presentations can be quite blurred. So we know the epi- epineurium of the nerves are innervated. So you could, we can have a nociceptive radicular presentation. We also know that the axons of neurons can be sensitized by inflammation. So you can have what we call a neuritis. You can have radicular symptoms without any compression on a scan. We can't kind of write radicular pain as not going on just because they don't have those classical neuropathic symptoms. And equally, a normal scan doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have radicular pain. It's just not that simple. Typical clinical phenomenon, you know, we want to learn this kind of black and white algorithmic linear view of a condition and wish it would be that way in clinic. But I guess that's what makes it fun being in the clinic, trying to kind of hash through some of these mechanisms and differing presentations. I'm wondering with, and I I want you to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think with this, you bring up radiculopathy being thrown out there imprecisely. My understanding, and maybe you'll correct me here on air, which is completely cool because definitely I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. Is that like true radiculopathy is when we have hard neurologic signs accompanying the the diagnosis. Am I right in saying that or is that kind of terminology or definition not? Accurate? So it's, it's a loss of function to oppose to a gain of function. So it's not even describing a pain state at all. The neuro- physiotherapists often use the term hard signs they've got hard neurology i don't know if you use that over there in the states mark but but i've never really seen a surgeon use the term hard neurology but it essentially means that they have a loss of sensations or hyposthesia a loss of muscle power or reflex loss so it's a loss of function to oppose to an increase of function which is interesting because nerves can become hyper excitable also when they're injured so it's gain and loss. Gain means a kind of an, an addition of a symptom. So pins and needles technically is a gain of function, even though it's a kind of nervy sensation. But the radiculopathy is exclusively in relation to sensory loss, power loss, or reflex loss. I'm wondering if you can speak to a little bit more of that mix presentation. I know you mentioned the susceptive versus neuropathic and how folks... Kind of, and again, we don't have to get into the nitty gritty weeds of all of the every different mixed presentation, but I wonder if you can go a little bit into that mixed presentation thought process and where maybe there's some misunderstandings and misapplications of kind of diagnostics and treatments. I, I tend to think, first of all, is there evidence to suggest that the pain may be in some, on some level related to the nerve root at all? Okay, there's a paper by Steins, which is, there's a nice little algorithm that you can use. And if they have pain below the knee, if the leg pain is worse than the back pain, if they're, if the kind of context fits and there are other signs and symptoms, then the totality of the information is pointing towards it being a nerve root type problem. Now, if they have those classical neuropathic symptoms, the burning, the electric shock, type symptoms, they imagine a spectrum to the far right, you've got those classical neuropathic radicular symptoms. And I like to use the word radicular neuropathic. So at the far right, and then moving a little bit kind of to the middle right, you've got those, it's more of a nociceptive or an inflammatory type description, but they still have the dominant leg pain that's worse than their back pain etc you've been able to bring on their leg pain doing some kind of mechanosensitivity tests so we we need to not kind of you know die on that hill um with with the descriptions there is a paper also there's a kind of rehash of the iasp kind of algorithm so the neuropathic which i to be fair i've kind of a love and hate relationship for many years because weakness isn't in there <laughs> and, uh, and neither is numbness so it's well clearly they have a nerve that's damaged because they have a foot drop 
but so their pain is probably neuropathic but but they, that wouldn't be included you see so this paper looks to recalibrate that a little bit and you can follow the steps but really it's the totality of information having pain in your calf with some semblance of relationship with their lower back i would say that's almost like a shorthand for radicular pain I, i'm looking certainly from an interventional perspective and an educational perspective i'm looking I'm kind of trying to increase my, I would call it diagnostic confidence. So there's a couple of ways to do that, that that clusters, the Stein's paper, your confidence in the patient's report of that information, the context, you probably want to be somewhere near 70% and above uh, to be kind of saying, you know, I think this is ridiculous in nature. I'm wondering too, with young physios and are definitely some price season physios we can always imp- improve our clinical practice with as far as your neurologic examination goes with these obviously there's a standard myotomal dermatomal reflexes central you know upper motor neuron things i'm wondering if there's anything else you add to that or if there's anything you've commonly seen as you've maybe mentored younger clinicians or other clinicians that isn't maybe where ideally it should be if we're going to really confidently be able to kind of get our hands or our head around some of these diagnoses? My examinations probably become more economical over the years, Mark, to be honest. I probably do less now than I did a few years ago. I think we need to think about safety and we need to think about evidence that is going to move the needle in terms of managing that patient. So I have a very standard economical power and reflexes screen that that touches on all the main nerve roots but it's quite economical i don't do all the little toes for instance um so i i would do that in all patients that that i would see even lower back patients from an educational perspective um because we patients cannot declare sometimes they will not declare that they have weakness in their leg i once had a patient who had a a foot drop and they didn't declare it and I didn't notice it when they were coming in and when I said have you got any weakness in your legs they said no and then you know as soon as we sat them on the edge of the, the bench you had a really floppy foot so th- missing that as a junior physio is a kind of a is would be a, a tragedy so definitely reflexes and power with all of your patients if you can't get them tested well in sitting do it in lying do it in some different positions. And that's really one thing to, to learn is have a standard approach, then, but then know how to test the muscle function in different positions if you've been standing or lying. My sensory testing is even more economical. So I would only screen with, for light touch, sharp appreciation if the patient reports that they have a sensory deficit in the leg. So if they if they tell me fairly early on that the outside of their left calf is numb, I would wear that high and then I would obviously investigate that and compare to the other side. But I think for cultural reasons, for time reasons, for value reasons, doing an indiscriminate test of all of their dermatomes from their upper thigh all the way down to the foot in a busy clinic that they've not reported anyway so how useful is that information i don't do that anymore and i think that there's this tendency particularly from experienced physios to say oh yeah i check sensory more i'd I'd, they just reel it off this i check sensory but but how do you do that and how are you deciding to do that and i think we're given the impression that they're doing that properly over skin with every single patient, that's not realistic. And I would wager that they don't. Rubbing your hand over their leg with a trouser on, that you may as well not have done that at all. You bring up also good points with the different positions. Uh, having students regularly, it's always like you learn it in this one way of doing it, right? We all learn our, our neurologic examination sitting with our you know lab partners, you know, sitting across from a student this way. And it's just, it, it's always been interesting to see how difficult that is, but a, a big aha moment for a lot of younger clinicians of like, yeah, I guess I could do this laying down or, you know, in different positions to make it, you know, still be 
good information, just accommodating the patient, right? Especially patients with low back pain sometimes don't like to sit, or if they sit more than a few minutes, things get pretty painful. So it's good to have some different approaches to, to accommodate the person in front of you. I think one other thing people can benefit from this is kind of understanding that whole step care approach that I know you talk about a bit. And maybe that goes into some of the natural history of this thing because there's the u.s is probably the worst i remember working at the mayo clinic love the place there's some great people there don't get me wrong but i remember seeing acute radiculopathies and the physicians would get them and it was like every non-guideline based thing you could possibly throw at it let's image it let's inject it let's do everything that's just again way uh you know outside of again some of it of course if there's progressive neurologic loss and things but i'm wondering if you could speak to a bit of the step care approach as far as how you, when you have some of these, I know it can be dependent on timeframes and where they are in the situation and their exact presentation, but I'm just wondering your, your thoughts on how you would manage one and maybe making these decisions on, Hey, this is a conservative care is doing what it needs to do, or, Hey, we need to step up into more higher level levels of care where maybe imaging and neurolo neurologist or spine surgeon consults might be in order. There was a nice study, a randomized control trial, the SCOPIC trial here in the UK. And what it found was that fast tracking patients for more interventional treatments was no better than a stepped care approach. So there is evidence for a stepped care approach. There's also a study called the NERVES trial that shows that the nerve injections with when patients who don't have profound neurological deficits is just as helpful as microdiscectomy. Um, so already we can see that stepping our patients from less interventional to more interventional patients makes sense. We know that big groups of people get better anyway by 12 weeks in one study, 50% of patients had 75% at one year. And we know the patients who have very acute symptoms, like under a couple of weeks, many of those patients do well and never access care. So we, we want to kind of take a stepped approach. We don't have very good prognostic data. So we don't have a crystal ball, unfortunately, Mark, to kind of say they should definitely kind of be in injected immediately or operate on immediately. I suppose the scopic trial was, the hope was that was going to uh, give us more data in that direction. But we don't have, we don't, we can't do that right now. So we want to enter the pathway, advice and education, supported exercise, nerve root block, surgical consultation. We want to enter that pathway at the least, in the, least intrusive position. So now that doesn't necessarily mean that they're all at the beginning. It doesn't mean they all start with advice and education, but we want to try and enter at the lowest reasonable chevron. Now, there are a number of factors that we can go into that contribute to that, but that's the general gist of a stepped program. That's what we use in the NHS. That's what I would use to patients where we're a little shy of sticking needles in patients and operating on patients. And we can maybe go through those variables, if you like, Mark. No, that'd be great. I'd, I'd love to for you to go into those. That would be very helpful. So the red lines, obviously, if the patient presents with red flag pathology. So the three Ps is a nice way to think about that. So they are progressive weakness. So you see them over a couple of visits and they've gone from a four out of five to a three out of five so it's kind of it's getting worse over the visits profound weakness so anything under three or two anything under three out of five would indicate they've got a profound weakness in the leg and the other one is poly root so they seem to be weak at a couple of different root levels so maybe at the ankle and the knee then those patients you just need to move them on you just need to move them to your specialist service, to your specialist clinic, whoever that may be. Um, other things like pain severity may con come into it. So I don't necessarily think that just because they've had pain for two weeks, three weeks, that we shouldn't inject. If you have access, if they've got severe leg pain and they have a preference towards interventional management, they're safe and you have access 
we do have data that injecting early is helpful. So that could be a consideration. I tend to find that many patients really don't want to be injected immediately. So so their kind of preferences are, are taking that out of your hand, I guess. There are a couple of kind of outcome measures that you can use to look at disability and leg pain severity, but just getting an understanding of how much this is interfering with the patient's life is obviously going to be a good way to look at it. Diagnostic confidence, again, you know, how confident are we that this is a ridiculous problem? Are we going to be looking at interventional management when it's pretty equivocal, a presentation? Or perhaps their main problem is their back. So if they have some leg pain, but their back pain is their main problem, we're not going to be considering injections for those people because it's not their main problem, it's their back. You know, 60% of all people with back pain have leg pain, Mark. So so it's not like everyone who has leg pain has ridiculous pain, or indeed that even if we do feel they may have some ridiculous involvement, that a nerve root injection is going to be helpful. The last thing I would say is if they're getting better, if they're getting better, even if they're not fully recovered, we probably don't want to be injecting those patients. So if they have a trend of general improvement, maybe over six, eight weeks, and they're managing and they're on board with advice or maybe supported exercise, then we probably want to hold on to those people. That's helpful for sure. I know a lot of folks are probably going to benefit from hearing some of that. A good review for some of us and definitely good tips and pointers. Definitely there's some things that I hadn't thought about quite as in detail. So th- thank you for that. The ec- economical approaches, uh, neurological approaches, you kind of talked about kind of your economical exam because there's like a difference between, you know, a busy clinic where you got patients coming in on, I, I'm not sure how frequently, but often on the half hour, sometimes more quickly, especially if you have any, you know, urgent cases that need to get squeezed in and, and that type of thing. I'm, I'm wondering kind of economical, not only from a time uh, aspect, but maybe economical from a cost aspect. And NHS is much more cost aware, I guess. I mean, the U.S.'s system sometimes is more revenue based <laughs> as far as what, what gets done is often what you know, and that's not always the case. There's some great healthcare systems that are very conservative in nature, but I sometimes want to pull out even the remaining hair I have left when I hear like people just automatically jump into surgery and you hear their symptoms going into that were like mild, you know, none of the red flag things that you spent, you know, spoke about that were, you know, dictating a, a you know, stepping up of the care into some more in, in, in interventional ways of getting at it. I, I'm wondering how, you look at the economical uh, of kind of concepts, again, both from a time and financial aspect as you manage these cases. So, yeah, so I, I think that in, in terms of the care that we offer, I, I suppose I am quite economical in terms of, I don't think all patients need courses of visual therapy. You know, they've had this awful thing land on them out of the blue. You know, they were going about their business fine. And these things can be quite, you know, they've never had a problem before. And all of a sudden, they've got this raging leg pain, strange sensations into the leg. And then we're coming along and going, you know what? We need to develop a all singing and dancing rehabilitation program. They may not have time for that. They may already have interests and activities that they like to do. So kind of meet the patient where they are. It may be that we encourage them, you know, look, you, you would usually cycle, you know, maybe see how you feel doing some short cycles, uh, our walking program. Maybe they're still going to the gym and we say, look, we can in- incorporate some aspects into that. But I don't try to see it as like, you know, you have to come to physio for six sessions. I think it depends on what the patient wants. And it depends how much time they've got. It may also be that we tell them to back off some things. It might be that, you know, perhaps you need to back off the gym a little bit if it's too intense. So advice and education, having clear route for review, um, using the neurological exam to tell a story about the nature of their problem. Um, And then using, we have in the UK something called PIFU, patient initiated follow-up so essentially it's kind of this looks like it's improving you're doing some 
you're doing some good activity. We know this is largely a time thing. You know, you're managing your problem from what you're telling me. Let me leave the door open and you can enter within a, a, an amount of time if you need to. So I'm kind of anti come to the clinic every week all you know the bells and the whistles I, I i don't think that we need to do that necessarily was that a transition for you at all do you think as far as i know earlier in my career i felt like this need to have to feel needed in a patient's case i think to where i almost like probably looking back recommended i'm much more fine with saying hey similarly like this trajectory looks good a lot of education reassurance and hey leave the door open like you said and you know, occasionally people still come back and might need maybe, okay, there are, it does look like it's progressing. It took a turn for the worse. But I'm wondering if that was a difficult per- transition for you at all. I, I worked privately before I came to the NHS and as a, a band five physiotherapist. So I was very wet behind the ears. And I was certainly kind of, it was instilled into me that, that we need to see these patients regularly. We need to treat them regularly and I have to say, for a period of time, I felt quite awkward doing that. Like, I felt a bit uncomfortable. It was almost like there were things that weren't being said. So the patient was begrudgingly coming for a tennis elbow or something like that, and I was, you know, doing the same things I did last time. And I got the impression the patient doesn't really want to come, but they're coming because I'm asking them to come. And I'm, well, I'm doing and saying the same things we did last time. So, but it was a kind of like a culture, isn't it? Of you come for your six sessions, you get your calls, you come for your six sessions because that's the best way to do it. And when I moved into working in the public sector, because, you know, time and resources are a variable, I, I guess, I become more, well, what would you like to do? And these are our options and, and kind of leaving it in their court to decide. And so we could do this, we could do that. And, Having worked a little bit more privately in, in recent times, I, I've carried that over, really. At the end of the consultation, I'm less a physiotherapist, more a musculoskeletal professional. And I'm so nothing serious going on. These are your options. We can work together over X amount of time. That You know, if it was a tendon-related problem, or I can design some strategies you can take on and leave the door open, or you can you we can say bye today and and you're doing some great things already so i've certainly changed my 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 way of thinking and way of practicing that sounds familiar as far as your transition i think you know we're talking to physios you know both here in the states and abroad you know in the private setting there can be some pressures economically of of maybe having to see people more frequently Again, different reasons. So I'm fortunate I work in a university clinic setting where it's very much, you know, what's best for the patient. Not that, again, we can't do some things, of course, if we're seeing people in person, but I do tend to echo the thoughts of oftentimes people don't need formal bouts of physio. I mean, if they want it and that's, an, you know, you give them an option, like you said, and you can work together, support somebody in the natural healing, let their natural healing process take center stage instead of some amazing technical prowess that we're trying to bestow upon them. And that I think overcomplicates matters and oftentimes gets them, you know, in, in the thinking that's a necessary or must have part of the recovery where oftentimes the body, if given the right context and the right support can kind of right the ship on its own. I mean, I, I appreciate Mark, just to say, but it, I suppose it's very easy for, for me to say that because I can do it. Um, but you know, I don't have those additional pressures. So I, I appreciate that might be, it's easy when you don't have that pressure to say that. But I also think we've got to be a little bit modest with what we can provide and what we can do. Certainly in this area, but in all the areas, I think it's become pretty apparent that most of the improvement that we see in problems that do have natural histories is probably not because of what we're doing physically. That's sometimes such a hard pill for physios as well. I know for me, probably earlier in my career, I struggled for that. But I I think recovery coach is a a good way to look at it sometimes as far as supporting what bodies are designed to do. And a lot of times it's insulating them from a lot of interventional narratives or things on the internet and Dr. Google and things. I'm wondering how much you deal with that in your practice as far as, you know, patients where 
they've you know watched the latest YouTube video or they've you know Googled whatever, and then they come in with all sorts of catastrophic thoughts or needs to have these you know major tests. Maybe is that one something you deal with, and then two, you know, what's your approach to kind of maybe talk people off the cliff of jumping into interventions that may not be you know necessary at that point in their so it, in this particular group if you're getting to those kind of typical ridiculous neuropathic cases they're, they're fairly easy actually because they and i suppose that's why clinicians some clinicians will lean towards tissue-based narratives because I suppose that there's less conflict, there's less challenge when you're there. But with those barn door cases, you know, the nature of the problem, the prognosis of the problem, you know, they they think it's a nerve problem and it is a nerve problem, you know. In some cases, if they've got, you know, these nerves may be injured. So, you know, there is a, a, a medical language that applies and we, when it's appropriate, sensibly, we should be talking about that. So we, we shouldn't be just because we're developing more into a biopsychosocial approach doesn't mean that we, when there is a clearly a structural uh, element going on, I don't think we need to be shying away from that it's still the B, isn't it? Um, uh, what, what I would say is more challenging uh, is those kind of recurrent cases where they kind of come and they don't have symptoms anymore, but they've had it several times in the past. Chronic cases are very can be quite difficult because even when you use the labels or say, well, yeah, you have radicular pain or we reconceptualize sciatica, many of those patients are just not going to respond to interventional management. That that would also include patients who've had previous surgery. It seems to be that operating on patients who've already been operated on when they've got residual or chronic radicular symptoms just don't do well. So the conversations around that when there is a tissue narrative and it's appropriate to use can be difficult because we're not really managing them with interventions as, as such. They become chronic pain patients. So even though they have a legitimate label, it's similar with stenosis, I guess, Although I do find it a little bit easier with stenosis if you meet them earlier and they've not had surgery. So so I suppose the other group is just that equivocal group where they've got some other pain states going on. They've got some leg pain, but it's just not really adding up to anything ridiculous in nature. And many of those will push for, for imaging, you know, understandably, I guess, in some cases. And I think as a junior physiotherapist, those kind of gray areas are, are more challenging for sure. Definitely plenty of gray out there in the clinic. That's undoubted. Um, you speak to a bit about the place for tissue-based mechanical type diagnoses. And I, I think there's been rightful criticism, especially around, you know, the craze of pain science, pain neuroscience education to, and you'll hear just, you know, bad examples of physios just completely shelving like a good physical neurologic examination and immediately defaulting to, you know, this pain, chronic pain, persistent pain, and getting way into the pain neuroscience education weeds with people. Is that something you've seen too in your practice or in your experience where, and maybe I know for me, I did have a period where I probably swung. I know I've talked to Jack March and other folks who we, I think we all have this like, you know, new information. We grab it and like, oh my God, I want to just, you know, change the world with this new information. And it comes back to reality of like, okay, right person, right place, right time, not just bombard everybody with it. Has that been your experience that you've seen with the pain science craze? I think that it might be a bit of a misrepresentation, to be honest. I think on people would probably look upon me and think he is, because I am, you know, very invested in rehabilitation and biopsychosocial working. And just because you hold those views it doesn't mean that you don't examine your patients, that you don't triage patients, that you don't consider sinister pathology. I, I actually think that to arrive at this place and still champion it after a period of time, to, to find yourself in this place, you have to have gone through that and, and respect the tissues and the structures to find yourself at this place. 
I personally feel. And certainly you will get misrepresented on Twitter quite a lot if you champion things like, you know, we need to manage stress and we need to we need to reduce this overprotective movement strategies. You know, those things can still be true and have a place and still be vigilant for uh, serious pathologies and tissue based kind of diagnosis like so I'm kind of like straddling the bench because the reality is they're both relevant aren't they but so I, yeah I, th- I think it's probably I think I would see less individuals who are just totally chomping at pain neuroscience hard you know and and just kind of forgetting about that I would say it's probably the other way around if I'm honest I think it's these false dichotomies that get created on social media where you know one side saying all you're doing is thinking about the tissues you're not doing any any talking with people and getting another unique stories and then the other side saying the opposite where a more nuanced you know view of, of that you nicely demonstrate is you know it's all of it you know you can't you got to do all of it and, and make sure each patient gets a thorough examination to look at maybe whatever sides of, of those coins that they may fall in and it's obviously a lot of a gray and challenging you know things we have to you know weed through with patients I'm wondering, as we talk about the physiotherapy input into these management of cases, I know it's different and different. NHS might be a little bit different than the U.S. I know there's definitely, like in the military here in the U.S., I mean, we got kind of similar, I think, to extended scope practitioners there in the U.K. where there's, you know, prescribing rights and can order imaging and do different things. I'm just, in the general scheme, maybe in your practice and then maybe what you see physiotherapy's ideal role in the management of these cases should be like what kind of input do you feel like we need to be having in the management of these cases so it probably will depend on the position within the pathway that you work in so i work in triage so i will whilst i'm i'll be considering all management approaches and i'll have access to all of those management approaches including the interventional ones so I don't have to move anyone further up the line before I would investigate. But I am a physiotherapist and, and I, like I said, I do subscribe to doing as little as is required. And I would say our roles as coaches, as educators, as safety netters, as, as just, you know, decent human beings, you know, remaining vigilant, well-educated in these particular areas. I'm certainly one for, I love my reflex hammer and and becoming very efficient with your reflex hammer, with your handling skills, with your education. So, but we're not fixing people, are we? You know, we're offering the prognostic information that what's the likelihood of their recovery. We're being realistic. We're then coaching and facilitating approaches that reduce suffering, that help them make sense, to keep them doing things that they value and not to scare them, you know. So so we're not pushing things back in. Uh, we're not fixers. We're not mechanics. We're coaches. And actually, the evidence for physiotherapist interventions, you know, whatever they are, ultrasound and taping and, you know, McKenzie's and whatever, uh, the evidence is actually very poor. So, you know, we can't really, you know, physiotherapists or physical therapists or analogous professionals or anyone in terms of conservative management, none of us can say that we do, we offer amazing treatments because the evidence doesn't exist. It's very poor. It's not to say that we don't, we can't help in that direction. But, the, you know, we need to be modest, I think, right now. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes I think we want to feel like this. Maybe it's a self-worth thing in the grand scheme of our profession, feeling like we're really making a difference, that we have to have this, like, agency over a person's recovery where the reality of the situation is, you know, a lot of these conditions are going to navigate the way these conditions navigate naturally. And we can definitely support it in a more efficient manner and give more adaptive advice to have people hopefully recovering at a more rapid rate than need be. But as you've mentioned, also nicely recognizing folks where, man, this is more than just your recovering redick. There's some serious, you know, red flag signs. It's progressive. It's polyroot. It's things that need a more of a stepped approach to where 
we can be the facilitator of, of getting those folks up the chain a, a bit. So I'm wondering, last topic, and then I want to respect your time, as far as where you where the role of activity plays in your, I know you've already spoke to a, a bit of that as far as like, hey, maybe I need to pull somebody back from the gym. Maybe I need to, you know, get some people moving a little bit who are more on the self-immobilizing, self-limiting you know, where maybe it's not necessary. I'm just curious how you kind of look at the role of activity as you're managing some of these cases. We want to know what they already do, don't we? So what's their level of activity, if it be leisurely, if it be occupationally, if it be kind of uh, commuting, that kind of thing. What's your level of activity in different domains in your life? And are they doing what they usually do or, or are they doing less? What's the level of that? Are those things too painful? If those things are too painful to do and it's unacceptable to the patient, then we might be advising backing off. So if they do four spinning classes a week and, they're, and they are in intense pain in their spinning class and they're falling off the spinning bike, then we may perhaps go, you know, it might be helpful for healing to back away from that. Maybe they do an office job. Uh, factory job and standing all day long and that is particularly uncomfortable can we get them can they take time off <laughs> I, I don't think that's always a bad idea if what they're doing is comfortable then can we just continue as they are or maybe we can dial it up a little bit we do know that there is some evidence for cardiovascular exercise being helpful to the recovery of axons when they're injured so the, some basic studies in rats. But, you know, trying to get a person who's in quite a lot of pain to push themselves on a cycle m might be a hard sell. Following on from that, if, if they want some kind of program, they want to do something else, then you've got lots of options, haven't you? You can do your McKenzie's if you so wish. I generally look at like basic stretching. We have something on our website called Backtracks. So basic stretching, walking programs, swimming. But really, I don't want to try and, and reinvent the wheel. And, you know, I just want to get a feel for what patients want to do and kind of go, you know, entertain them and go down that route while we're given this time. But I think we need to be very heavy on the expectations you know, we can't expect that this problem will get better in a week. It just does not work like that. You know, if you get the expectations right and you you get to know your patient and all the usual things, you've listened to them, you've examined them. You've I like to use a model. I've got like a, an anatomical model. I know that some people it's talking about nerves and discs. So, so yeah, that, I've got a, a bit of a, a flow chart that I've developed that I talk about in some can maybe share that with you, Mark, but a very basic algorithm to determine if we need to push someone or pull them back or what type of activity we want to do, if it's therapeutic and kind of structured or if it's, you know, push, get some more spinning sessions in. Anything you can share, we'll, we would greatly appreciate. And we'll link the articles that uh, Adam mentioned earlier on in the show notes so you all can take a look at those as you'd try to help better help your practice as far as managing some of these cases. I wanted to thank you for your time today, Adam. I really appreciate it and really appreciate your expertise and sharing it with us today. Thank you very much, Mark. For those of you listening, if you can subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast, for those of you watching on YouTube, we'd love if you could subscribe and maybe even share this episode with somebody else who could help benefit from learning a little bit more about lumbar radiculopathy, but we'll wrap it up there and we'll talk to you all next week.